Okay. Okay. So please. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Henry, for the nice introduction. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, verification of quantum programs, in particular from the you know perspective of whole logic. So I'm from you know University of Technology Sydney, and this is the sorry. This is the outline of my talk today. So firstly, I will you know very briefly introduce the motivation of this line of research. And, and also, I think, you know, many of you are from, you know, quantum computing community. So I assume that not many of you have the background in formal verification, especially in whole logic. So, so maybe I will spend most of the time on the introduction of the classical whole logic in the verification of classical programs. And the, 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 the third part is you know, how to extend the basic idea of the classical whole logic to the verification of quantum programs. Okay, so if you have any question, please don't hesitate to interrupt me during the process, okay? So I believe that every one of you have the, you know, experience of programming, right? So if you do so, then I trust you have already realized that programming is very error prone, right? Especially when you are trying to you know, write more and more complicated programs, you will make many, many more errors. So you can imagine that it is very important to have some technique for the verification and debugging of programs. And basically, you know, in you know, current days, every software company has a you know, testing department, right? So the job is quite simple. You know, you, if you have an executable software, you just run it and observe the output to see if they are expected. So this is simple, but the disadvantage of this approach is also obvious, right? So firstly, the, the software must be executable. So meaning that the cost of correcting an error is normally high, right? And the second one is you can never guarantee the correctness of the software. No matter how many tests you have done on it, you cannot say that, you know, there's no more bugs in it. So to deal with this problem, another approach is to do formal verification, especially for using the, the so-called whole logic to do the verification. So once a program is proved correct in this system, then you can guarantee that there's no bugs anymore. Okay, then another advantage of this approach is that this one is actually based on the source code. So meaning that you can find some bugs in the early stage of the development. And actually this, this, this knife approach was proposed by, you know, a Tony Award winner, Tony Hall in 1980. And the original idea actually came from another Turing Award winner, Freud, in 1978. So this is the, the, the background of whole logic. Now to introduce the basic idea of you know, using whole logic for the verification of classical programs, the first task is to define a target language. And in this talk, we are going to focus on a very simple so-called while language. So the syntax of this language consists of three parts. The first level is the so-called arithmetic expression. So here we use the symbol E to denote a generic expression, which can be either an integer constant N or an integer variable x, 
And also we can use the operations, for example, addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and so on, to construct more complicated expressions out of simpler ones. And also the second level is to build the Boolean expressions. So here again, we use the symbol B to denote a Boolean expression, which can be either true or false, or the comparison of two arithmetic expressions. So here, this Thai symbol can be either like, you know, less than or equal to, less than, larger than, larger than or equal to, or equal to, right? So essentially, we just compare the values of two expressions, two arithmetic expressions. So furthermore, we can include, you know, more complicated proportional formulas into these Boolean expressions, like negation, conjunction, and so on. So after that, we can, you know, construct our programs in this way. So here, S is a program. It can be, you know, our assignment. So here, X is an integer variable, and E is an expression, both from the first level of the syntax, right? So this is just assignment, which assigns the value of E to the variable X. The second construct is the sequential composition. So meaning that we do S0 followed by S1. And then this construct is so-called conditional construct so, or conditional branch. So if you uh, have any experience of programming, you you, you must have already known this, this construct very well, right? And this is the while loop. So you can see that this language is very simple. And normally it serves as a core of other, you know, more practical languages. So for simplicity, we just take this language as the target language of the whole logic we're going to discuss today. Okay. Now, to give the formal you know, meaning or formal semantics of programs, firstly, we need to introduce the notion of program states. So here, a program state sigma is just a function from program variables to values. So here in this talk, we only focus on integer values. So for example, the state sigma can map x to one, y to minus five, and x3 to 2000. So intuitively, you can think of this state as a memory state in the computer. So these variables actually represent the location in the memory, and the value denotes the value stored in the location. Okay, then we can lift this this definition of states to arithmetic expressions in a very intuitive way, right? So for example, the value of E1 plus E2 is just the summation of the value of E1 and the value of E2. And also we can define the value of Boolean expressions similarly. But in this case, the value should be either true or false instead of an integer, right? And for simplicity, we just write in this form, meaning that sigma satisfies B if sigma of B is true. Okay, so with this preparation, we can define the so-called operational semantics of programs. So normally we, we we give this semantics using some you know transition rules. So here we list six rules here, and in each rule we have a pair, which is called configuration. So the first part is just a a, a, a program, right? And the second part is a state. So the intuitive meaning is that currently we are going to execute this program 
and the state is sigma. So we can see the first rule says this program at this state can make a single step and becomes this configuration. So here we use this symbol, the special one, E, to denote the termination of a program. Okay. And this state means that it is almost the same as the state sigma, but with the value x updated to the sigma of E. So you can see this transition actually captures the intuition of the assignment exactly, right? And for this transition, so we are dealing with the composition, right? So that means if the first component S0 can make a single step to become S prime sigma prime, then the composition can also make a single step without changing the second component S1. Okay. And for conditional branch, so we have two cases. Depending on if sigma satisfies B or not B, we, we choose one of the branches to execute. Okay, similarly for this while loop. So you can see by giving these three, six, you know, transition rules, we can give the, the meaning of any program. And, and this, pro, this way actually captures the execution of a program in a real computer, right? But sometimes this operational semantics is complicated. So we're going to introduce another one called denotational semantics. So in this case, we just define the denotational semantics of S on input state sigma as the final state sigma prime after a finite step of transitions. So here, E means this computation already terminates, right? And the final state is sigma prime. But in some cases, the program might not terminate, right? So in that case, we use a special symbol, bot, to denote the long termination. So you can see the denotational semantics of S can be either a valid state sigma prime or the long termination symbol, bot. Okay, so here is a simple example. So can you, can you tell me in you know, 10 seconds to say what the, this program computes? Yeah, actually, it's easy, exponential right? Exponential of uh, two to the exponential. Yeah, it's uh, just two to the n, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So now let's, let's let's see how can we can we verify this using our computational, you know, operational semantics, right? So starting with this program with an arbitrary state sigma. We just use the transition rules. For example, the first step is to execute the first statement, which is assignment, right? So according to the transition rule, the program becomes S1. So S1 is the subprogram starting from the second statement. Okay. And the state becomes, you know, this one, meaning that it is almost the same as the original state sigma but the value of exp becomes one. Now, and so on. So you can do the computation easily and find that when terminating, the state becomes this one. So the denotational semantics of this program S maps sigma into this final state. So you can see the final value of this variable exp becomes two to the n. So verifying that you know, the, the program computes the two to the n of the you know, value n, right? 
Okay, so this is uh, the formal semantics of programs. Now, to verify the correctness of a program, another key notion is the so-called assertion. So in classical case, an assertion is just, uh, you know, first order logic formula. So there are some, you know, simple examples. For example, we claim that X is larger than one or Y squared equals two and so on. And for state sigma and uh, assertion P, we can verify if sigma P is true. Or we just write sigma satisfies P. And then we have you know, some examples. For example, in here, if the value of x is three, then of course it satisfies x larger than one, right? And again, if sigma of exp is eight and sigma of i is three, then sigma implies uh, satisfies this property exp equals two to the i, right? Now, using this assertion, we can define the correctness formula or whole triple of classical program. So here the S is a program and both P and Q are assertions. And normally we call P the precondition of S and Q the post condition of S. So we call this triple is true in the sense of partial correctness. You know, for if for any input state sigma, which satisfies this precondition P, if the final state is not the bolt, meaning that the program terminates properly, right? Then the final state must satisfy Q. So you can see the intuitive meaning of this one <clears throat> is that if the program terminates, starting from some state satisfying P, then the final state must satisfy Q. Okay, in contrast, in the autocorrectness, starting from a state sigma satisfying P, we must guarantee that the computation terminates properly and also the final state satisfies Q. So you can see the the only difference between these two notions of correctness is the way of dealing with non termination, right? So total correctness is a little bit stronger than partial correctness, in that it it guarantees the termination of the program. And for the sake of simplicity, in the rest of the talk, we only focus on the partial correctness. Okay, and in this case, the task of program verification is just to check if this triple is true semantically. Okay, so of course we can do it directly from the semantics of S, right? Because we have already known how to compute the operational semantics or the denotational semantics of S. So we can check this formula directly from the definition. But normally this process is very complicated. So the whole logic on the contrary, provide another you know, syntax oriented way. By giving an axiom or inference rule for every you know, program construct. So because in our simple language, there are only four you know, program constructs. For example, assignment, composition, conditional branch, and a while loop. So to give a you know, whole logic proof system, we only have to give the axioms and the inference rules for each of these four program constructs. So now let's look at how we can do it. The simplest one is for the assignment, x equals e. So this is the axiom for this assignment. The better way to read it is you know, starting from the post condition and read it afterward. So that means if we if we want to establish the 
post condition P, then we should have this precondition. So here, this one means we use P, but replace the X in P with the expression E. For example, for this simple program, if we want to establish the post condition X, equal, X equals one, then we just replace the X in this formula with one, right? So the resultant results is one equals one, right? which is true, of course, right? So that means for this program, starting from any state, we can establish X equals one in the end. This is obviously true, right? And similarly, for this program, if we want to establish EXP equals two to the I, then the precondition can be EXP equals two to the I plus one. Okay, so we, will, we are going to use this one later. The second rule is for the sequential composition. So the goal here is to establish this formula. And to do this, we need only find an intermediate assertion P prime such, such that these two guys hold so this formula and this formula. Okay, so for example, we already know that from the first axiom, the assignment axiom, we can prove this one, right? Because starting from this post condition, we replace exp with exp times two, then we have this precondition. Similarly, this one can be proved using the assignment axiom by replacing i with i plus one, right? Then note that these two guys are equal. So we can use this rule to combine these two formulas together to have this formula which is for this sequential composition. Okay, so from this rule, you can see how we can, you know, combine proofs for simpler programs to the proof of a complicated program. Now, the next rule is for consequence. Okay, so it says that if P implies P prime, and Q prime implies Q can be proved in the underlying logic. So in our case, the underlying logic is the first order logic, right? Then we can, you know, starting from this formula, get this formula. So in a sense, we can just strengthen the, the precondition and we can, the post condition, right? So for the, for the example, we already know that this formula is valid, right? On the other hand, we, we also know that this implication holds. Right? So by using this consequence rule, we, we can derive this formula, right? So in a, in a sense, we just simplify this precondition from this formula to this formula, right? So because this one is the same as this one, we call this formula an invariance of this program. Okay, so this is how we can use the consequence rule. And the next one is for conditional branch. So the basic idea is also simple. So to, to prove this formula, we just have to prove separate formulas for S0 and S1 with the same post condition Q. And for the example, if we want to prove this formula, then we can just you know, prove this one and this one separately which is also easy from the previous axioms and inference rules. 
Okay. And finally, for the you know, while loop, so this is a little bit more complicated. So in the proof of this one, we have to introduce another key notion of you know, whole logic, which is called loop invariant. So here you can see this, this formula P holds both before and after the execution of S. So this P is called loop invariant. And actually the only difficulty in you know, using whole logics in verification of real programs is the construct of this loop invariant. In many cases, we need to tell the tool how to you know, develop a, a proper loop invariant to finish the proof. And finally, we can use all the, all the proof rules presented above to complete the, the proof of our running example. So now we already know that this one is valid. And note that this one is just the loop body of this while loop, right? So to use this proof rule, we have to show that this assumption holds, right? But this is easy because you know, this one and this one implies this one. So by using the rule of consequence, we can derive from this formula to have this formula. Finally, we can prove that this one implies this formula. So by using consequence rule again, we can prove this one. So that means if we have the post condition exp equals two to the n, then the post, the, the precondition of the while loop can be this formula as well. Okay, with this, we can finish the proof of, so, so here S is the, the simple example I just showed before. And the, the, the post condition is exp equals two to the n, right? So we start from the post condition and we already prove this formula. And, and then using this one and use the assignment assignment rule, then we, we have replaced, we can, we can replace this I with zero, right? To get this one. And finally, using the assignment axiom again, we arrived at this one, one equals two to the zero. So which is obviously true, right? So that means we use this whole logic to prove this formula. And one of the most important results in classical or whole logic is this two theorems. So which says that this proof system is both sound and complete. So by soundness, it means that for every correctness formula, if it can be proved in this proof system, then it must be true semantically. And for the completeness, it says that if a formula is true semantically, then in principle, it can be proved from this logic system. Okay, so this is for the introduction uh, to classical whole logic. Any questions so far? Okay, so if no questions, then let's move on to the you know, verification of quantum programs. And for simplicity, the, in this talk, we only talk about the very basic quantum hall logic proposed in 2012 in Minshan In's paper. And in, in this paper, we only consider the, the, the so-called puny quantum programs. So here we can recall that the syntax of the classical well language, which consists of these four parts, right? And naturally, 
we can extend this language into the quantum case by simply replace this classical assignment with two more constructs. So the first one is the initialization. The second one is just the application of a unitary transformation. And also here we replace this Boolean expression B with the qubit Q. So the intuitive meaning, intuitive meaning of this one is to first apply a computational base, basis measurement on Q. And if the outcome is one, then we do S1. Otherwise we do S0. And similarly for this while loop, we replace the Boolean expression B with the qubit Q. Okay. And similarly, we have to define the, the notion of, pro, uh, of, of program state, right? So in classical case, a state is just a function from program variables to integers. And in quantum case, so the natural candidate is the so-called density operator, right? But in programming theory, it's more convenient to consider partial density operators instead of density of operators instead. So here by partial density operator, we mean that the choice of row is less than or equal to one instead of being one exactly. So we are going to see why it's convenient to consider partial density operator in the semantics of quantum programs. Now, again, for the operational semantics, we give this kind this several, you know, transition rules. For example, the, the first rule just encodes the execution of the initialization. So here, row zero Q is just to, to put the state of Q into cat zero without changing any uh, the state of any other quantum systems. So only one thing should be mentioned here. Uh, yeah, so for this if then else statement, so because we have quantum measurements involved in the execution of this program, so normally we, we expect that we have some, you know, probabilistic transitions, right? But here, because we encode the quantum state in this so-called partial density operator, which, which is actually unnormalized, right? So you can see that in a, in a way, we actually encode the probability of achieving some proper quantum states into this kind of partial density operator. In this way, we can have this non-deterministic transition instead of probabilistic ones. Okay, so let's look at a simple example. Uh, so for example, if we have a single qubit Q, for the initialization, we just put Q to be cat zero. And then we apply the Hadamard gate on Q and do this while loop. So we measure Q, and if the outcome is one, then we do Hadamard gate. Otherwise, the program terminates. So from this operational semantics, we can calculate the transition from this program S and the initial state rho. Right? So the, the first step is just the initialization to make the, the state Q to be zero, okay? So rho zero is just in this form. And the second step is apply, is to apply H on zero, then the final state is rho plus, right? Now, if we measure the qubit Q, then with probability of half, the program terminates, right? Obtaining the final state rho zero. So you can see we use this one, which is not a proper density operator, but a partial density operator to denote the partial results at this step. 
Okay. But you can see there is other possibility that we get the measurement outcome one, right? In that case, the result should be half row one. And then we, we apply this Hadamard gate on one to get minus. And then we do another round of measurement. And in this case, we have, you know, another, you know, a quarter probability to terminate, right? Similarly, for any n, there is a possibility that we get the one over two to the n row zero, which means the program terminates at the n step, right? But you can imagine that if we are unlucky enough, then this computation can go on and on without terminating, right? So we call this transition divergence. Now, from this operational semantics, we can also define the denotational semantics. So because we use the partial density operator to represent the quantum states, then this kind of denotational semantics can be easily defined by just sum up all these partial density operators together. So you can see, starting from S and rho, this configuration, if we if the program terminates at finite step and get the, file, the, the partial result low prime, then we just you know, sum up all the possible low primes to have the final result of S on row. And you can easily check that this definition is well-defined because the trace of this final state is again less than or equal to one making it a proper quantum state by normalization. Okay, so back to the simple example, we already have this operational semantics, then the denotational semantics is obtained just by a sum up all these possibilities, right? So here we get the result row zero. So, which matches our intuition, right? Because that program should terminate with probability one and get the final result being zero. Okay, so the next key notion is the assertion. In classical case, we have assertion being defined as, you know, first order nordic formulas, right? And in quantum case, this can be no can be naturally extended to the so-called Hermitian operators on the Hilbert space. But here we, we need to put some requirements on the Hermitian operators. So the requirement is its eigenvalues should lie within the unit interval. So that means this operator should be positive and bounded above by identity. And now for classical state sigma and classical assertion P, we can, we can check if sigma satisfies P, right? And in quantum case, this kind of satisfaction relation can be extended to a quantitative one. So meaning that for a given state rho and our assertion M, we can compute the degree of satisfaction which is defined in this way. So you can say physically, it just the you know, expected value when applying the quantum observable M on the quantum state row. Okay, so with this notion of, of quantum states and the quantum assertions, we can define the, the correctness formula for quantum programs which is also such kind of triples, okay? So here S is a quantum program and both P and Q are quantum assertions. So this formula is true in the sense of total correctness. 
if we have this one hold. So you can compare this one with the classical definition. Uh, in classical case, we have total correctness means sigma implies P, sigma satisfies P implies the final states satisfies Q. But in quantum case, this means the expected value of rho satisfies P is upper bounded by the final state satisfies the degree of the final state satisfies Q. So if we replace this satisfaction relation with this quantitative you know, value, also this one with this one, and replace this implication relation with this less than or equal to, then we have a you know, very you know, natural idea how to extend the classical definition to the quantum one. Right. Now for the partial correctness, the only difference is how to deal with the ter non-termination, right? So in quantum case, we just add this one in the right-hand side. So intuitively, this one means the non-termination probability starting from row, right? Yeah, because trace of the final state means the, ter the termination probability. So if I take this subtraction, we get the probability of long termination. So this is contrast with the classical case where we define this partial correctness in terms of this one. So again, we can replace this satisfaction relation with this value and replace this implication with this less than or equal to relation and also replace this disjunction with the summation of probabilities, right? Now, again, for the, you know, the approach of quantum Hall logic, we have to develop axioms and inference rules for each construct for quantum programs. So here, uh, yeah, we, we have the axioms for initialization, which also can be written, can be read from the post condition to the precondition. Right? So from P, we just you know uh, replace the the part of Q with this one, and the other part we just you use the identity permission operator. Okay, because of the time limit, maybe I will skip the details of this part. And I just mentioned that for, for this cons consequence rule, we use this relation to replace you know, the original implication relation in classical case. So here, this one is the, the so-called loner order, which means P less than or equal to P prime if P prime minus P is a positive operator. Again, the most important part of this quantum Hall logic is the, the while loop in which we have to develop the, the quantum invariant to complete the proof. But you can see from this inference rule, the, the, the proof rules for quantum loop is very different from the, the classical one. But anyway, the basic idea is similar. And also in, in Mission's paper, it has been proved that this, this proof system is both sound and complete in the sense that every you know, formula can be proved in this whole logic system if and only if it is correct sem semantically. Okay, finally, I, I, I would like to give some references on this line of topic in case you are interested. And so the most you know, widely investigated topic is for the purely quantum programs. 
And, and uh, so my talk today is based on this paper um, published in 2012. And uh, this is the first paper which provides the, the of a sound and complete system for verification of purely quantum programs. But before that, there are also two papers. So the, this one actually first gave the definition of, of quantum assertions. So you, using Hermitian operators. And this paper in 2007 proposed some proof rules for verification of quantum programs. But in that paper, there's no complete result presented. And also, uh, recently, you know, just in this year, we have a paper about verification of non-deterministic quantum programs accepted by SPLOS. And, 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 and another line of research is to add classical variables to quantum programs. Uh, because as I mentioned before, the, the language I, I consider today is just you know, purely quantum in the case that there's, there's no classical variables involved. But for many you know, quantum algorithms, it's more convenient to have some classical control, right? Classical variables in, in the program. So we extend this program system to, you know, to involve classical variables. So these this are two papers about this topic. And also another line of research is about the relational quantum hall logic. So for this kind of whole logic, it's convenient to consider the robustness of quantum programs. Uh, so by robustness, it means that if you have some you know, small disturbation on the input state, so what's the effect on the final state? So there are two papers about this topic. And for two implementations, and the first one is is implemented in Isabel, I think. And the second one is on Cork. So this is a very recent work. Okay, so this is the talk today. I hope you guys have some you know, basic idea of you know, quantum whole logic. Thank you.